Good morning. Um, again, I'm Dr. Booth Jones. Um, I've been at the Moffitt Cancer Center almost 22 years. I was hired specifically for the transplant program um, because we determined and decided over 20 years ago that brains were vital organs. So if you've heard the term vital organ testing and you were at the Moffitt Cancer Center, there's a darn good chance you saw me at least once. I can't speak for other cancer centers because they did not decide that brains were vital organs, but at, at Moffitt we do, and uh, we really want to know what you look like ahead of time so we can be there with you after and make sense of what's going on. So this is the title. Um, we've all heard the term chemo brain. In Europe it's called chemo fog, but there are a lot of issues, and it's not just one name for one phenomenon. So. The goals for this talk are to really talk about the incidence of cognitive changes, the type and duration, what can we do about it, how can people cope with it, what are the current interventions, sort of the state of the art, and then where does general wellness fit in? So when we talk about cognitive deficits, and a lot of people who I see say, oh, I just don't want to be any stupider. Well, who does want to be stupid or nobody? But that's not really what we're talking about. Your base intellect doesn't go anywhere. In fact, we don't even assess for it because it's something that's been pretty much set in stone from the time you were very little. But what does change are things that change with your energy level, the chemistry, either of your own personal chemistry or what we did to your chemistry by adding things or taking things away. And these are the things that really can change what people talk about is the ability to pay attention and concentrate, but attend to what they want to. I don't know how many people in this room are thinking about their right foot right now, because you learned, hey, I don't want to think about that right now. I want to think about what's going on in front of me. You're able to focus your attention away from things that are part of you right now, but you're not thinking about it. Hopefully nobody's thinking about what they're going to have for dinner tonight. Hopefully. Or Game of Thrones, episode four. Anyone? <laughs> okay. Um, memory. Memory means a lot of things to a lot of people. What we really are talking about in memory is things that happen in day-to-day -day life. Oh, did I take my pills or where did I park my car? Those sorts of things. Not, gee, where did I go to high school? That's not going to go anywhere. Your autobiographical memories don't leave. It's the day-to-day -day living. Speed and stamina, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but sort of my buzz phrase, and I've seen almost 10,000 transplant patients. Sometimes it's the same patient multiple times, but at least 10,000 visits. Um, People do a lot of things really well, they just do them slower. Quality is great, quantity might be down a little. And then executive function. And that doesn't mean running a company, but it's really what we're talking about. The executive function is the frontal part of your brain. That's what separates us from all the other animals out there. How do you problem solve? How do you strategize? So what's the incidence? I don't know if y'all Google, I, I live on Google. Um, it's everywhere, every number out there, so let's just pick 50% because on any given day, someone's going to say, I don't think like I used to at some point in their treatment. This goes across actually almost all cancers, not just transplant. So you kind of get lumped in a little bit with everybody else at that point. However, there are some reports that say almost a quarter of people have some really severe cognitive changes. Now, changes don't imply impairment, nor do they imply permanency, but at some point, they feel that they've really changed. And whether you're feeling it subjectively or I see it objectively on testing, I'm gonna stick with that at some point. But again, it doesn't mean permanent. But when we talk about changes, if someone's superior, and a lot of people think they are, um, being average doesn't feel good. That is considered a moderate to severe change. Are you impaired if you become average? No, but boy, does it not feel good. Okay, so we always have to think what change means. It doesn't necessarily mean an impairment. Uh, if you look across studies, um, there's a lot of variation. Um, and so I looked at this third bullet. Studies with long-term follow-up vary, with some suggesting good recovery by one year. I'm like, oh, I Googled that one. That was me. I wrote that paper a long time ago. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was like, oh, my God. I can't recall. Seriously, but I actually was funded by the American Cancer Society to see people before transplant, six months out, and 12 months out, and if physically they were well, cognitively they were beautiful. And I found that very heartening. And they actually looked better than they did pre-transplant, and I have some thoughts on that. But there are other studies that said there could be some problems for up to 60% of people in the two-year follow-up. But what do problems mean? Remember, everyone's two years older by then, 
And I can tell you when people say, I want to be just like I was before transplant. I'm like, oh, you're older. I cannot do that. Um, but I don't want to belittle it. But again, problems don't necessarily mean impairment or disability. So why are people different? Why? We're transplanting you know, cells, or, or in some cases bone marrow, some people stem cells. Why? Well, your brain is an electrochemical organ. So if the electrical chemical uh, makeup changes, you can think differently. Some people are predisposed to not thinking as well long term. There is an allele called the AP, APOE4. And the reason we know about this allele is through the VA system when um, some of our soldiers were coming home and not recovering very well from traumatic brain injury. Why was a certain percentage of people not recovering well? They all kind of look the same on MRI or similar enough. And it looks like um, about a fourth of people have this genetic weakness that they may not recover as well. Some people are predisposed to having cognitive changes. Strong family history for Alzheimer's um, and other genetic um, predispositions. So not everyone's created equal. Sometimes during transplant and recovery, the brain has actually been impacted. I've seen this unfortunately many times, very low platelets, someone falls, they have a bleed, that is a trauma. The brain doesn't like it. Um, some people develop um, the HHV6, the herpes encephalitis 6, that attacks your, where your memory is here on your temporal lobes. It's, you can recover from it, but you do take an impact. So there can be complications, those are just two. Um, nature built the blood-brain barrier for things to stay out of the brain. A lot of times medications don't even cross. Some do. So sometimes there's a failure there, or there can be even DNA damage. Be and we know that when people get secondary cancers from the first treatment they had, and we see them for secondary AML, your DNA changed. Well, who's to say that didn't affect your brain and central nervous system? But what are other factors? Age, like I said, you're not getting any younger. I'm not. Um, and there is some normal, not huge, but normal decline as we age. There's a thought that men's brains tend to mature in their, to their fullest in their early 30s. Does that makes sense to anybody? We can nod. <laughs> Women tend to mature a little sooner. Um, Education actually matters. Um, that's one of the demographic variables that we always want to collect, um, with more education tending to be a little bit more protective. There's this term called cognitive reserve. People that have just a big old bunch of intellect up there, you can lose a little bit and still be pretty functional. You may not like it, but you really can be out and about and doing what you need to do. However, if you, were, you have limited cognitive reserve, you're sort of fragile, and that's one of the things I would see on pre-transplant testing, that you kind of already have some issues before we see you, you're probably more vulnerable. It's like a, a fragile bone. There's a chance it could break with stress as opposed to someone's got really hard bones. It could take a lot. There are a lot of psychological and behavioral factors as well. Some people come to their cancer journey with issues. They already have a history of major depression or anxiety. They could already have some really bad behaviors on board, a lot of risk-taking behaviors. This is never a personality transplant, okay? So if someone's already taking risks, bucking authority, saying, oh, I don't need to wear shoes, I can still garden, I can still be out in the sun five hours a day, those sorts of things, I don't care what the doctors say, you know, these are factors that could actually just worsen your overall health and you know, the brain is connected to the rest of your body. So if the rest of your body is being beat up because you're not doing everything you can to stay on track, you could be at greater risk. And then there is the precancer neurological status. Part of my semi-structured interview with everybody is any history of head injury or loss of consciousness. You'd be amazed, amazed how many people have had head injuries. You'd be amazed how many people don't know they had head injuries. I've literally had siblings say, yeah, I dropped my brother on his head when he was a baby. Literally, I'm not joking, like, you did? Yeah. Or someone, yeah, you were in a terrible car accident, you went flying out the window, we didn't have seat belts back then. On and on. So head injuries, um, though people may recover and be very functional, can actually leave you somewhat more fragile. 
So I mentioned the psychological factors. Now, some people come to transplant with a history of, of depression. It can be major depression. It can be um, postpartum depression. Um, it can be the perimenstrual depression, bipolar depression. These things can happen. But some, for some people, they had no depression, no mood instability at all. But they get the cancer diagnosis, and they become absolutely petrified on the inside and don't see the future the way they thought they would. That's called an adjustment disorder. It's, I hate to use the word disorder. I actually use the word reaction. So on my, on my business, it's an uh, unspecified adjustment reaction because I hate to give people psychiatric diagnoses that have the word disorder. And if I don't think you're disordered, I think you're just having a, a reaction. So sometimes it's just truly an acute change in the moment. But also the medications they give you. Has anyone, and I don't need a show of hands because I don't want to get into people's personal stuff, but been put on high dose steroids? And then you put on an emotional roller coaster? Has anyone ever been on steroids and become sleep deprived that they really can't think well? Some people are prophylactically put on Keppra so they don't have seizures. Great anti-seizure medication. But it's dampening your brain down so you feel like the world is sort of flat for some, gloomy for others. I don't know if anyone knows Winnie the Pooh, but I see a lot of people on Keppra looking like Eeyore. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, but you're not having a seizure, so I'm like happy with it. I'm not going to change it. But I want you to understand medication that's designed to change your brain chemistry can change your mood. Anxiety. We need it. If you all didn't have a little bit of anxiety, you would not be in this room today. You would still be somewhere else, okay, in bed. You need a little bit to get up and go. There's something I don't even tell you. It's called the inverted U. So it's a little bit of anxiety is good. It gets better and better until it hits a point when too much anxiety freezes you up and you're not doing well. For some people have a long history of anxiety. Some people it's literally just because of the diagnosis and what they're going through. For some people it's specific. The night before MRI, the night before biopsy, seeing me, ah, testing. A lot of people have test anxiety. Be really aware of the anxiety levels. And of course, medication side effects can also make people feel somewhat anxious. Sleep. There are studies everywhere that saying without sleep, your brain is just not very happy. There's classic insomnia. At some point, someone's not slept well. But there are other things that we really want to look at. Obstructive sleep apnea, snoring. Quite often, the patient doesn't even know they're doing it, but their loved one does. Very well. I um, have to say that um, people who have untreated sleep apnea can look like they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And it's one of the things that we see when there's really no other um, ex clear explanation and the loved one is saying, oh, you would not, oh my goodness, you would not believe what, what our nights are like. Sleep study, really need to have one. But mostly from our, my patients, it's not insomnia or sleep apnea, it's pain anxiety, or actually symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, you know, rolling over in the sheets, you know, getting the feet and just ugh, up again. Uh, the other thing I didn't put is um, frequent urination, depending on what they're on. And just, you got to be able to get through that whole sleep cycle. If you're not dreaming, you don't have to remember it, but if you're not going through a whole sleep cycle, you really aren't having a healthy brain. So we really want to talk about sleep hygiene, if that does seem to be the issue. Um, Full disclosure, I've already had two cups of coffee today. I love caffeine. I don't like it past noon, because that's my cutoff. Um, but I like it, and I think I'm better on caffeine. And there are a lot of studies in my world of neuropsychology where we take, um, we always use undergrad students just because they're there and they want, <laughs> <laughs> they want three extra points at the end of the semester. And so if you take, you know, a hundred undergrads, say this side of the room, off caffeine, and a hundred undergrads on caffeine and give them a neuropsych test, who's going to do better? Oh yeah, five points here, three points there. So we know for most people it's relatively safe, but when you're feeling that fatigue and you're dragging, you might start having more and more and more of it, thinking more is better, and get to the point where it's interfering with your sleep. So you want to manage it. but. In my semi-structured interview, I ask about smoking, drinking illicit drugs, and then caffeine. And like, like, why do you put caffeine after street drugs? I'm like, it's just, just the way my test flies. No, I, no, it's good. I already had mine. Um, with sleep, I also talk about setting a routine. 
Um, I don't know how many people go to sleep with a TV on, with an iPad, getting that white light, bathing your eyes, or the blue light, rather. Um, there's really only one uh, handheld that's acceptable, really, f to help the brain shut down, and that's you know, the, the Kindle Paperwhite, because the blue light is known to disrupt. So that's another way to check your routine. Um, you should also sleep where it's cold. You do better if you're cold and it covered. So if you're hot and sweaty, get a fan on, lower the AC, take off more clothes. I don't know, whatever works for you. But the real routine has to be reset after hospital stays. I don't know if anyone can remember getting woken up every two hours or multiple times in a two hour window. Um, when I visit people, sometimes there's signs that say, nobody come into my room unless essential. I'm like, oh crud, they called for me, am I essential? And I'll start like walking and waiting, like, I don't know, did you want me? Like yes, but don't wake me up. Like if sleeping, do not bother. Um, and it's really hard for people to reset. But without sleep, you're not gonna think well. So. Disease recurrence, fatigue, and cognitive changes are the three biggest complaints that we hear. So fatigue after disease recurrence is really gonna be my number two. So it's very common, but you can be exhausted and actually sleep well. You can be exhausted and sleep too much. And I really wanna help people understand, I believe, and the way I've conceptualized this for the last few decades, is we're all given just a certain amount of energy every day. Let's call it 100. We all get 100 energy units every day. Well, when you're going through a transplant, any kind of cancer care recovery, a lot of your energy units are just being used up on the inside. You look like you're just sitting there doing nothing, but you're not doing nothing. You're working full time, triple overtime, no vacation, and then you're asked to do these other things on top of what your body is already doing, trying to regrow an immune system, try to tolerate all the medications, all the disruptions, so you can be utterly exhausted and people around you may think, but you didn't do anything. Oh, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> you just can't see it. So I really want people to understand fatigue is not necessarily poor sleep, but if your body is fatigued, so is your brain. They are connected right here. So when I have people say, you know what? I'm gonna take care of all my medical insurance forms today. Like, <laughs> no, you're not. You might get through a couple, shred the duplicates, circle to highlight the ones you want, but you're not gonna sit and do it all. You'll be making mistakes. The bigger one is, I'm gonna do my, um, empty my inbox on my email. You're gonna be replying to all with spelling errors. Stop, pace yourself because you are fatigued. I want your quality to be excellent and your quantity to be smaller. Two or three emails. Take a break, do something different. But I also wanna point out, when we all go on vacation, and hopefully we've all had one at least once in our life, did we sleep? No, we did some, something. We did something different. When you are feeling fatigue and you think you've had enough sleep and there's no medical reason that you can't be up and about, do something different. Test one of your other senses. You know, that old saying, stop and smell the roses, they probably don't want you to be anywhere near a plant, so don't do that one. But do something else. Go get a cold drink. Maybe walk to the mailbox with sunscreen. Get your mail. Do something other than just sit and do another cognitive task. There's an interesting analogy, just one of the other hats I wear is I um, work for the National Hockey League. I'm with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Been with them for 22 seasons. When someone has a concussion, we want them to recover, we put them on a rehab where they do 15 minute increments. 15 minutes of rest, 15 minutes of cognitive activity. I don't know, Sudoku, read, paperwork, whatever. And then 15 minutes of physical. It's called a circuit in 15 minutes. So then you have 15 minutes. I don't know what you do the other 15 minutes or do something. But you see, can I get through a whole circuit and stay functional? We don't say sit down and get all that paperwork done because you will not do well, but take these breaks. It's called pacing, or kind of getting the idea of circuits. And this really helps people recover from the trauma of a concussion, which is an electrochemical injury, kind of like you guys have long-term, or some of you, long-term, as opposed to an acute injury. Pace yourself, break it up with restful time, cognitive time, and physical time. But, I think I mentioned I'm part of the vital organ testing at Moffitt because I can see this fatigue even before they come to transplant. So that's another thing we always want to measure because remember, by the time I see someone for transplant, they've already had chemo. You guys don't come to me brand new. Um, 
And also, obviously, fatigue can be related to low counts, medications, and so forth. So we have to take that all into consideration. Those should all be time limited. Nutrition. Quite often, our patients are on immunocompromised diet, but I have had people that ha are, are malnutri malnourished. There's a term called cachexia, when the body is actually just so far below, it's actually eating itself to survive. You got to eat. You got to eat fat and protein. I consider transplant patients being filled with between two and five million newborn babies. You don't give newborn celery sticks. You don't give them apple slices. You don't fill them up on water. I mean, stay hydrated, but you don't do that. You feed them the building blocks of a healthy body, fat and protein. I also, it's also important to watch um, you know, sugar levels, especially if you've been put on high-dose steroids. Um, so you may actually have a cr physical crash after eating, but you will have a mental crash too, okay? So you may think, wow, I didn't have chemo brain this morning, but boy, I ate lunch. You know, it was really simple carbs, and you know, I ate all this, you know, like a, peanut, a, a jelly sandwich and donuts or something, and then I crashed. I couldn't think my way out of a wet paper bag. Yeah, that's not chemo brain. That's blood sugar and nutrition issues. But these things are really important. If you need to really be sharp and be on, you want to be really aware of if you are one of the people that's prone to blood sugar issues, don't overload on the simple carbs. A lot of my patients are so small when they come out of transplant. Just deconditioning, but also to regrow those stem cells into an adult immune uh, system took thousands of calories every day, and chances are you didn't put thousands of calories in. So we see physical weakness, People have, you know, wasted muscles. They may not be unhappy with the total weight, but they'll hold up their arms and go, really? There's nothing there. And that's something that can actually, if the body's deconditioned, so the brain can actually feel sluggish and slow as well. Obviously, particularly with our uh, myeloma patients, the peripheral neuropathy can limit movement. Physical activity, like I said about the circuits, being able to have some restful time, cognitive time, and physical time, if you're not able to move because your feet are on fire or they're so numb you can't feel it, it may be hard to, to keep that movement going. But physical stamina and mental stamina are linked. So when I do my intake um, for part of the transplant, you know, again, people are coming with their own personal history. Some people are learning disabled. There's a certain percentage of our population that has a specific learning disability existing as in childhood. Am I going to call them impaired on a, on a list learning task if they have a, some sort of verbal learning disability? No, it's just evidence of their learning disability. Some people have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Some of my older patients may have MCI or mild cognitive impairment, a precursor to a, a full dementia, a dementia or se severe mental illness. Just a little, some people are worried about my appointment. My appointment does not stop a transplant. Unless the person says, get me out of here, I don't want a transplant, which has happened twice, by the way. But um, because you're alone with me, and you don't have your family pushing you. But let's say it, you know, it's a go, everyone wants it. These pre-existing conditions are risk factors, so we can put, make you safer. So let's say you do have a dementia. And just an example, one attending sent the same patient back to me three times so they could pass the memory test. I said, dementia is a progressive disease. Every time you send her back, she loses three points. Stop sending her back. Let's get two caregivers and make sure everything's presented in writing to the caregivers, keep her safe. She did really well. Um, so again, these aren't rule outs for transplant. These are what can we do to keep you safe in transplant. We also want to know what's bringing you to trans, what you might be bringing into transplant that could be causing cognitive problems. Alcoholism, not good for the brain. You are going to have some memory problems. Uh, substance abuse, it depends on the substance. Um, nic nicotine and tobacco not necessarily hurt the brain long-term functioning, but a lot of people actually do better on nicotine. They feel more calm and able to focus. We say, hey, D, you can't have that. And they actually look a little more chaotic on testing. So it's important to know that. And I'm not advocating nicotine for anybody. I'm just saying it's important that I know where you are on your tobacco nicotine dependence journey if that's an issue for you when I do testing. Marijuana, of course, it's everywhere now, medical or not. Whether you know it or not, it could be in your CBD. If you've gone to CBD, it's usually at 3%. And um, so what long-term use, you may look like you don't have the world's best short-term memory. But you're really pretty calm about it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't care, I don't care. I'm not joking, by the way. It sounds funny. So why do I do the, um, the testing? 
I want to know what's happening right away in the pre-transplant. So, is there a problem that's present and is there any, what's the severity of it? Because we want to be able to watch this over the transplant course. And for me, transplant isn't just getting you out of the hospital or getting you home. It's really that first couple of years. Because we want to, you know, be able to know if there's an intervention that would help. Hey, do I want you on more caffeine? Do I want you on, on we'll talk about the pharmacy later. But also, if anyone who's ever worked with me, I give feedback immediately. Like, I'm scoring as fast as I can. I give feedback, same appointment. A lot of people come in and they miss one or two things on a list learning task. See, I have Alzheimer's. I'm stupid. I'm a moron. I'm so stupid. It's all that chemo. I'm like, uh, you actually just scored about two standard deviations above normal. You're actually superior or you're high average or you're average. You're just a scooch under. Or if you're in really bad shape, you usually don't care. Um, but <laughs> for everyone else, subjective complaints and objective complaints don't match. They just don't. So I have people that say they have phenomenal memories and they don't. And people who say they have um, horrible memories and they're wonderful. So it's really important because subjective and objective just don't match. So um, I don't think everyone ever, you know, always has to have a neuropsych eval, but if you're gonna have one, we need to be ready for you. And what we need to know is address all misconceptions be really clear the purpose is not to weed you out from transplant, but to understand how your brain is working, because I come from a strengths perspective. If I can find something that's working, that's what I'm tapping into. So if you're much more visual spatial, I'm going to tap into the, that, that, that side of you, or if you're more verbal. Um, in the real neuropsych world, testing can be like 10 hours. Yeah, I'm happy to get one hour. And that's what I try to target, one good hour of your energy. Um, so. What's really important here? I have had people literally get out their driver's licenses to show me who they are, but this is who I look like before cancer got to me. You know, I had hair, I'm not puffy, you know, I look good. Um, but I also wanna know who you were before educationally and occupationally. It's really important, you're not just a number to me. I review medical records, I read everything. Outside records too. Um, but I also wanna, you like I said, people come to me already impacted by their cancer treatments. Got to look for substance use. And then I always want to know, as you're sitting with me, are you in pain? Are you fatigued? And you're having distress? Because I want to address those things. I always throw in a cartoon. This is a short-term memory clinic. Shoot, what did I come in here for? How many people, and I will take a show of hands, have walked into a room and go, what, what am I in the kitchen for? <laughs> okay, do you all have chemo brain? No. I haven't had chemo and I did it. I do it all the time. Literally, we are multitasking constantly. You could have been distracted. You might have heard the, the click of your mailbox as you're going down. You, what you really want to do is get the chicken out to defrost so you can actually make dinner, but you heard the click and you go, what was I in the kitchen for? It's not a sign of anything other than you were distracted at that moment. So when we want to test, like I said, intellectual ability, I'm just going to assume um, that I can get that from a reading test. There's a, there's, I will not do IQ testing, but I really want to look at simple and complex attention because that's probably the number one complaint. People say it's memory, but it's really attention. Speed, learning, language, and like I said, exec, executive function. Uh, I've already kind of answered this. So IQ testing is just not essential. So if you go in the community and they go, I'm gonna give you a waste for, okay. They're gonna charge you over a thousand bucks, give you an IQ number that I can get on a reading test in three minutes. It's just a lot of money for someone, okay? But let's talk about attention and concentration. Not everyone is alert and oriented when they walk in. I've had, you know, did you just have a Xanax? You know, I was so nervous seeing you. I'm like, well, I'm not testing you. <laughs> I mean, I might interview you, but you're gonna have to reschedule because your eyes aren't even focusing on me. Um, I'm not joking. <laughs> it really does happen. Or, yeah, I just had my biopsy with anesthesia. Let's do the memory testing. No, come back. Um, so I really have to know, are you with me? Now, sometimes I'm, I have people at their best and they're not okay, and I'll take them then, but gotta be aware of that. Um, can they focus and follow instructions? Not always. Um, but they have to be able to focus across tasks. I have a lot of people that start strong and then peter out as the 45 minutes goes on. That's important information to me. Still valid. It means your mental stamina is really hit. Um, so how do we go ahead and, and look at tests of working memory? There's something called digit span. So I will say some numbers. When I'm done saying them, you repeat them back to me. So let's do it as a group. 
two, four. Six, three, nine. It goes up to a series of nine digits long. I'm not doing it, okay? Because I won't know if you're accurate or not because I can't remember that many. But that's, that's as far as it goes. But then I'm going to say some numbers and I want you to say them backwards. Let's try this one. Five, three. Three, five. Seven, two, nine, six, four, seven, three. <laughs> I'm telling you. So. <laughs> I don't even know what I said. But that's an example of working memory. And most people should be able to get digits forward longer than digits backward. And if you actually do better on backward, I usually think you're malingering. You're kind of faking me out. It's one of our little cheats. You should know that. List learning. You'll be given a list of words that's longer than seven. Why longer than seven? That's called super span. It's bigger than your working memory. And to see if you can learn over time. This is a direct impact on how you're going to learn in the real world. So a list of words will be repeated to you multiple times. You'll be saying them back and so forth. There's other ways to look at attention on a computer. Um, but when we look at memory and learning, and again, this is really important to me, we don't go around trying to learn lists of words, do we? We got smartphones, we got little steno pads, post-it notes, but our world is stories. So a story will be read to you, and you'll be asked to repeat it back word for word, it'll be read to you again. Re repeat it back. 20 minutes later, do you remember that story? That is what life is. Life is stories. So when you went and saw your doctor and they said, hey, this is what your MRI said, this is what your CT said, this is your schedule, this is your, who I'm referring you to, that's a story. It may sound like a list, but it really is a story. That's really, really important to me. Um, so immediate memory is kind of the here and now, and in our world, delayed memory is just a few minutes after. But we also have people that words just never clicked for them, weren't great readers wouldn't really pick up a book without pictures, and that's fine. I have people that just can't even read. It just happens every now and then. Um, but boy, they have great memory for figures and pictures. It's called nonverbal or visual spatial. I really want to tap into that. Um, because in a verbal world, a lot of people don't feel like they're doing OK. But when I can show them, because I'll have you copy a design, and then I'll ask you to, to draw it from memory later. And if you pull off something I can recognize, I'm really happy with you. And by the way, about my testing, I always say this, you can't fake good. So when people go, no, I'm just, I really don't have a good memory, I go, well, how did you get 10 out of 10? How did you get 20 out of 20, 18 out of 20, or 7 of Because you all don't know what's normal. I have normative data. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I know exactly what's normal and what's not normal. It may not feel perfect to you guys, but I can tell you if you're actually functioning well, because that tells me I, didn't need to, I don't need to send you for a brain MRI, right? If you can f pass all my tests, your brain's fine, but let's figure out what's going on instead. I really like speed. Like I said, people do very well qualitatively. I can get a lot of answers right, but quantitatively, I may not give you as many. So there's something called a trail-making test. Put your pencil on the one and connect targets in a certain pattern. But another thing I look for is, is um, verbal fluency. This is one we can do. So in one minute, and this is going to be interactive, um, I want everyone to, to list off as many fruits and vegetables as they, as they can. Go. Fruits and vegetables. Just shout them out. I'm hearing more fruit. I want more vegetables. OK. How? OK. All right. I heard cucumber twice, so you can't repeat. So, but I don't know if it was from you. I want to say, how many do you think you should get in a minute? Did someone say 60? <laughs> do you own a produce store? <laughs> Damn. Um, no, anything really over 16 makes me happy, right? But what I'm looking for is, one, can you stick to fruits and vegetables and not hit the bakery and dairy section? That's called losing set. That's a sign of not being able to stay focused. I also look to see, did you give me maybe 16, 17 in the first 30 seconds and then nothing for the last 30? I'm running a stopwatch and I'm hitting 15 minute tick marks. You petered out. So if your quality was good, I know you got it in there. You got that. You're pulling up, you know, got apples, bananas, cherries, strawberries. Da, da. Did you do anything smart? Did you go, oh, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries? Did you hit the berries? Did you hit the citrus? Did you hit the salad bar? Those are what I'm looking for. Are you using higher strategies to get me all these fruits and veggies? I, did my, I tested my husband 20 some odd years ago. 
And I'm thinking, why are you doing this? He thought they had to be alphabetical. <laughs> he was like, apples, apricots, bananas, cherry, oh, cantaloupe cherries, dates. I'm like, what? I never said that. Um, this is crazy. So I make sure I'm really clear with what I want. We do some motor speed testing, but I'll tell you, if people have peripheral neuropathy, it's not valid. So I don't really do it very much. But for executive function, problem solving and planning and tests of interference, I really want to make sure that you can focus and think and plan because that's really where we are different from every other person out there or creature out there. I always want to know where is your mood, your current quality of life, and I do a really good clinical interview with you and possibly a loved one. So wherever you get tested, make sure they're using real tests with real normative data and not just something someone kind of clues together. And it's really important to get feedback almost immediately. Um, and it's really helpful to have pre-transplant. So if someone's concerned post, because I really want to get into our interventions. So testing's been done. I saw you ahead of time. You looked great. You went to transplant. You don't feel good. I now see you. What happens? Well, if I think it's, your testing is still pretty darn good, but you look like you have a mood disorder, you can either have some therapy. You might actually just the feedback alone may make you feel better. Like, yay, my brain's working. So it's not about I'm not going to be stupid. Um, um, but if it's still a mood overlaying disorder, I probably will want you to see a psychiatrist or at least someone pro look, probably in your community. Obviously, with sleep, got to adjust sleep. Um, and if you don't know you're not sleeping well, I will ask your loved one. Um, if you're physically in pain, and this is very common, people may still have some pain issues or some symptoms, you know, I'm good, but I can't make that go away. So I really want your transplant team to see you, or if I think, you know, you're the size of my pinky finger, you may know the rules of nutrition, but there may be ways to get a little bit better use of having um, a referral to, to a nutrition specialist. If you're still using substances, probably not going to help your brain. It just isn't. Um, so maybe the psychoeducation is enough, but you may actually need a referral out. So let's say we've ruled out all the things that are pretty easy to fix. All right, so I got you sleeping well, you're off the crack, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> you're eating again. I mean, we fixed everything and you still feel like you can't, can't, you know, think your way out of a wet paper bag. Well, chances are, I will tell you, if it looks like it's just a speed issue, I'm probably going to want you to consider something that will increase your speed. And instead of necessarily running out and getting, you know, um, amphetamines, Ritalin is an amphetamine, or a non-amphetamine stimulant like Provigil, and both of them are great medications, I'd want you to try caffeine. How do you feel on caffeine? Is anyone better in the morning than they are in the afternoon? Anybody? I am. Good thing they asked me to speak in the morning. Um, <laughs> it's a really good thing. Um, some people are, are automatically put on a drug called Namenda which is a memantine, which is an Alzheimer's medication. It increases the availability of acetylcholine. Jury's out, why not? It probably doesn't hurt. But um, it can be sedating and so can Aricept. But that's what some people choose to do. And um, if you are put on any of these pharmacologics, I'm going to want to see you a couple months out and see if we're at least holding your own or getting you a little bit better. Right? I just don't want you to take it just because. But I'm really a big fan of knowing what works for you I'm so old, we used to have palm things, like little handhelds, uh, palm pilot, thank you. And then um, the dad of this one patient said, stop recommending it, he's lost three. So it was not a good compensatory strategy, they were expensive. So, but post-it notes, write things down, or use someone else's brain. I'm a big fan of having a caregiver, loved one. Hey honey, remember where we parked the car? We're in Snoopy 17. Yes, Snoopy 17. Now, literally. Use someone else's brain to help you. If you have something important to do, reduce the distraction. If you can, turn the phone off. You know, if you, you know, turn the music off. If you're trying to cook dinner, help your kid with homework, and the doorbell rings because FedEx needs a signature, you're burning dinner, snapping at your kid, and the dog's going to get out when you, you know, sign the FedEx because you just can't do all these things at once. So reduce your distractions, and I keep talking about pacing. Aha, you didn't know that. This is why elephants never forget. Didn't know that. There is some research that says, you know, physical activity is actually improving uh, cognitive activity, and I, I'm, I'm a big fan. You know, um, we always say that when you're physically in the transplant, get up and move. Get out of bed. Honestly, you can't eat too much, drink too much, walk too much, or talk too much. 
move. So even just gentle walking, puttering, sitting isn't good for any of us too much. The idea of meditation and mindfulness training is showing some promise, mainly just to be more self-aware and to reduce some of the distress. A lot of people have this running internal dialogue. I'll never be the same. I had a transplant. I may be here. I'm stupid. No. If you can kind of get the noise out, you might actually be able to tap down and focus a bit better. People ask me, should I do Lumosity? Should I be watching Jeopardy? Probably not right now with that one guy. Like, I wouldn't watch. But normally, seriously, damn. Um, but there is some evidence that it just makes you really good at, the things, at those things. Like, if you play Lumosity, you're going to get really good at it. Does it translate into the real world? Any game does. You could play Candy Crush. You could play solitaire. It's just one of those activities that's not bad for you, but there's no clear evidence, but there's no clear detriment. Where there is some evidence is people get better for learning something new. I'm going to plant, uh, maybe not planting, that's probably not good. Um, I'm going to teach myself a foreign language, or I'm going to try cooking a new cuisine, something new. I'm going to take up art appreciation. The brain likes novelty, like going on vacation. Like I said before, you don't go on vacation to sleep. You go on vacation to do something new. Cognitive rehab is really for people with major trauma, so it's not really designed for the subtle changes of chemo brain, but there may be something out there. There's a few that have been adapted. No clear evidence can be very expensive, but there may be some pearls. So some final thoughts, because I'm going to zip it here. Um, most patients have some change at some point of their treatment. They really do. It's real. Um, that's why you have caregivers. That's why you have um, Things presented in writing, you're not supposed to remember everything all the time. It's okay. But most patients return to their pre-disease levels, or at least their pre-transplant levels. And I can prove it, because I've done it over and over again. People are so surprised. It may be a little more effortful, but those scores don't lie. You can't fake good on my testing. I think patients really benefit from the knowledge. Knowledge is power. You know, you think you missed one and you're stupid. You missed one and you actually got like, a, you know, 110, which is like a high average score. You don't necessarily know the meaningfulness of walking into a room and not knowing what you went in for. It's pretty normal. But if there's issues, I'm very multidisciplinary. So if I think maybe your labs are low, you're not sleeping well, you're depressed, you're on really crazy pain meds that are making you all fuzzy, multidisciplinary. So now we switch to questions. Thank you very Sorry. much. And, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do the, one of these the running around because. You know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. What are your thoughts about CDB oil? Well, I learned a lot about it yesterday. Um, actually, the day before yesterday, there is apparently only one that is prescribed, Expedio, Expedidio. Anyway, that has absolutely no THC in it. There's only one. It's FDA approved. All others have 3% of THC added potentially. So if you are in a state where THC, which is you know, the chemical compound of marijuana, is allowed, um, maybe it's not a big deal. But the CBD um, from the FDA approved list, there's only one, um, has been shown to help people be more calm but I haven't known it to, so, and people can turn down their internal dialogue of, oh man, I'll never be the same, I feel bad, it may be helpful that way, but there are other ways, but I'm not, a, I have nothing negative to say about it, but I think the jury is so, so out on it, so brand new, because most of it, we don't even know where it's sourced from, but there is one FDA approved one. Not really a question, but just more of a comment. I had my uh, BMT at Moffitt and um, had the opportunity as part of my pre-transplant uh, workup of the psychological piece. was not aware it was not standard, but that one element really helped me to feel as though they were looking at me as a whole person, not just a physical aspect and that was appreciated. Thank you for that. It is absolutely standard and mandated at Moffitt and has been for now 25 years, but it is not standard elsewhere. So when I have patients coming from another center for their second transplant, or now they're going to CAR-T, because I do the CAR-T patients as well, and they're like, I never saw one at Acme Hospital elsewhere. I'm like, hmm, okay. I, I don't know why. My comment, it, well, question and comment 
thank you so much because you helped my daughter at Moffitt. I remember seeing you. Thank um, you. But she's she was a college student prior to her transplant, and she's just not getting back into college as of this year. And she's finding it extremely difficult for the classes that she used to have so much fun in. How can I help her so she won't take it out on herself and say, well, mom, I just got to keep taking this class over because it's frustrating her because I don't know how to help her Well, two things. Um, college is the time where you're learning more than ever, right? So it's, it's not just getting through your day. It's actually adding new information. So my, my comments, number one, Again, pace herself. Can she take a light load? Great. Good start. Is she accommodated in any way? Yeah, they're, t they're letting her have extra time for tests and extra time for study hall whenever she needs it. So she's got the extra study hall with class, and she's got the extra time for testing, but she's just she's so frustrated because she loves math, but now it's like she can't. it's just not there for her, and she's just frustrated. You know, we can talk later, but if math is math essential for her degree, she wants to do marine but, biology. So yeah, it would be. Yeah, because <laughs> we can always do um, get a course substitution. Okay. Which is an option. Um, you know, with a with a little bit more ass assessment. I mean, there are ways around this. Um, it, it's actually. Um, an issue nationwide of having math is college algebra has become a stumbling block um, for letting kids get past their um, AA or AS degree. And um, so nationwide, they're looking at removing that. Okay, thank you. But um, we can talk later if you need to. <laughs> well, one thing that events like this has helped immensely with is, is understanding things that you didn't know you had to learn. And my employer has been extremely supportive, but they don't know what they don't know that I know about this. Any resources that you could suggest that can help them understand myself or any other people in the company that may be dealing with these types of situations? Well, my concern would be that you could overwhelm them with like, the contents of a talk like this. Um, but I think the take home message is the quality of my work will remain exceptional. The quantity may go down for a while, but I will pace myself. And some jobs don't tolerate that, and some jobs can. It sounds like you have a great employer, which makes me happy. But it's really, for most people, the quality is fine. The quantity just goes down. So I don't know if you need to get them into the weeds of, well, the neurochemistry says. You know, I think they'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, okay, just, just do your job. Like, it's too much. But I think that's really important, unlike someone who's had, you know, a massive head injury. It's not an injury, per se. I've been pushing myself this year for both because last year was a disaster. This mm -hmm. has helped me to realize it's okay to back that off a little. Can I just say one other pearl I meant to say earlier? It just didn't get embedded in my talk. So I went to this chemo, chemotherapy conference, uh, doesn't matter, a couple years ago. Anyway, functional MRI shows that certain groups of people that have had chemotherapy, their brain stays in idle, sort of an idle mode for like an extra two to three tenths of a second. So it's called your reticular activating system, feel free, RAS. So remember, functional MRI is an MRI where you actually see activity. Okay, this means regular doctors will believe it because it's a functional MRI as opposed to me talking. So functional MRI means it is actually objectively documented that there's a certain group, maybe 25 to 33 percent of patients who've either had high dose steroids, chemotherapy, or so forth, whose reticular activating system stays in idle for an extra two to three tenths of a second. That doesn't sound very much, but if I said, and get me the this, that, and the other, you'd be like, I'm sorry, were you talking to me? So if your loved one seems to always be one step behind, honey, I told you three times you're going to Moffitt in like 10 minutes, go. I never heard you. They mean it, they're not lying. Say their name first. My husband is Graham. I'm just using him as an example. Graham, honey, Graham. We're going out to dinner at 6.30. Be ready, 6.30, okay? And he literally would be, okay, but if I said, okay, we're gonna leave at 6.30, what? Say their name, get the eye contact, because their brains, for some certain group of people, may be just a hair behind, and that's just enough time to, miss, miss, uh, to lose the plot, okay? No. Not permanent, but very real. 
Um, my uh, wife, who you know, um, she um, <laughs> she basically has times when she'll. I, I notice that like on Thursdays, she just wears down tremendously. I'm trying to get her to change her way she does things to the earlier part of the week so that it will make it easier for her Thursday. What do you think about something like that? I think pacing um, shows up in a microcosm of within an hour and across a week. I just think your energy is literally being used up. Um, I mean, we all kind of go, oh, TGIF, woohoo, we get, it's a weekend, we get to relax. But I just think you're petering out sooner. So I don't know if you have the option of like loading the front week with some, and then, but still staying purposeful and active for shorter amounts of period, uh, shorter amounts of time as the week goes on. It's just all comes down to pacing and having realistic expectations. Um, I have multiple myeloma and I'm on maintenance chemo. And you talked about the recovery time after the bone marrow transplant. What, for recovery time now for that, I'm still on chemo. Right. It, am I still going to be as affected as much or um, recovery? I know everyone's maintenance is different. My understanding, it's somewhere between one-seventh and one-tenth the dose you had before. Is yes. that correct? Something in that range? Um, if you are keeping your general wellness, you should stay pretty good. So if it's not interrupting your sleep, I hope it's not leading to neuropathy. That's mm, a little bit. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the double-edged sword for the maintenance for myeloma. Um, so sorry about that. Okay. But I, I would imagine that the I biggest... Hear. Whatever big hit you took from the transplant is going to recover pretty quickly, and then you'll be kind of floating around 95% for a while okay. on maintenance. Get me. She, she, she likes she, She's fast. She's Get trying. <laughs> they, need, they need two of you. Uh, mine is more of a comment. Sure. I did not go to Moffitt. <laughs> <laughs> I will not name where I went. Uh, my wife was a nurse, had been an oncology nurse, and so afterwards I was having the same symptoms. Uh, they did finally refer me to, uh, to somebody there at the, the center who said I was definitely not depressed, so we ruled that out. Good. Uh, but on our own, we went to an expert like mm -hmm. you and was, uh, anyway, they came up with a, a uh, I'm having chemo brain right now. This, this was 14 years ago. Oh, wow. That's, a, that's wonderful. <laughs> uh, executive cognitive dysfunction. Sure. Uh, so I went back and told my transplant doctor that. He said, oh, don't worry about it. Just get a secretary. <laughs> well, I mean, I know that sounds flippant, but that's, first of all, that's an unusual diagnosis to say it probably meant the higher level problem solving and the um the time it took you to do things was down um and so i kind of was joking but i wasn't really when i said you might need to use someone else's brain to remember higher level stuff or bounce things off other people or to kind of hey let's stay on task let's double check we're organized um and kind of pair up and you know balance your strengths with your your loved one's strengths and do it that way but that is a little bit of an unusual diagnosis I'm sorry I'm not sure what that person was referring to hi have um, oh, I, I did have my transplant at Moffitt and so just thank you because I think that I didn't realize how important that part was going in to transplant um, my question is I was a elementary school teacher for years before my first diagnosis uh, went through chemo didn't have transplant went back to work fine relapse now I have my transplant last summer mm. I am going back to work in August in a second grade classroom which <laughs> I'm happy I'm thrilled because I miss it but I have a lot of reservations um, mm -hmm. my principal's wonderful my school's been wonderful my biggest concern is putting it off on the kids if I am forgetful or get off topic or just I how do I go about explaining to seven and eight year olds um, why their teacher might just be a little out well, there. <laughs> luckily, seven and eight year olds only think about themselves. Well, so um, <laughs> you're off the hook on that. And I, I, I seriously, developmentally, they really think about them and what they're having for snack and is their you know, homework going to be hard. So if you um, do something, chances are it'll be bigger for you. Like, then they won't pick, yeah. Like, oh, I forgot to ask them to turn their homework in. 
chances are you're going to have a little know-it-all in the front who's going to go, oh, every, yes. do you every want our papers? Yeah. And you, you know what? Lean on that person because that person's going to love it. Like you're my, you're my <laughs> assistant teacher. Yeah, okay. Um, but but I, I, th I really think one of my favorite, favorite, favorite sayings in the world is it takes two people to be embarrassed, right? So if you do something and no one reacts, trust me, it didn't happen, okay? <laughs> you have no reason to be embarrassed. So, you know, seriously. So if you like, oh my gosh, I just called, you know, little Susie Q, little Stacy Q, dang. Like, if she, they didn't notice and they still responded. Okay. But they won't care. Okay. They'll just Thank love having you. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for one more question. We have two hands up here. The, the one in the front's been, her hand's been up the whole time. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, did I miss that hand? <laughs> Somebody's trying to trip me up over here. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you see any permanent cognitive changes and how common that is if it does happen. Well, permanent is an interesting word because I've been there a long time and I've seen, um, I mean, we don't really know what permanent means, but long term, let's use the word term long term. Yes, I have seen people who have had some long term changes, but it's not usually from the chemo. It's usually because there was an event. Um, or there was, it was really at a really crucial developmental time when um, the event happened. Um, and so if we look at adults, there really aren't too many critical developmental times really for men after the age of 33, after the for women about the age of 24. Um, so we're not gonna see that, but if there was a stroke, um, um, an, uh, an infection, if someone had press, or if someone took a fall and had a bleed, those can be permanent, but the chemo itself, the thought is really you're going to get about 90% of what you got after the first year and 10% the second year, and then you're kind of where you are. So it could be subtle, but I haven't seen anything. Um, there could be individuals, but it's pretty rare, and I see a lot of follow-ups. I mean, I, I probably do a follow-up. New patients probably 15 a week, follow-ups probably two or three a week. Most people are blown away that they're still doing so well. Terrific. Thank you very, very much. This was fabulous information. <laughs>